my DNA. I mean, I frequently view speed limits as suggestions for drivers with weaker skills. $100 speeding fine, I'll pay it tomorrow, turns to fade to appear, suspended license and warrants, all of which can be deadly when living in a world where a fetus seems to have more right to life than a fully formed black man. At first, I didn't even know it was the police. His lights were so bright and white, they outshined the colored ones, desperately trying to alert me that they mattered too. I succumbed to the siren and salt shelter on the side of the highway shoulder, determined not to be the color palette this cop used to paint the streets with our arms myself. With the necessary legal documentation, insurance card locked and loaded, driver's license in the ready position, hands fully visible because I wanted him to see it coming. This ain't no Western. Cowboy quick moves are often concluded with coroner calls and caskets. He, he steps out of his cruiser and sashays to my car. He spills out of his tank and tsunamis to the front line. No, no. He, he nightmares out of my dreams and Freddy Krueger's his way to my reality. And I, I don't want to be confused with Mexican. I mean, I mean, I mean, with Mexican culture. I mean, I mean, I didn't want to be this officer's piñata. So I shucked. I jived. I smiled. I yes, sir. I know, sir. I mean, I was polite and respectful with all the manners my mama and the military taught me. I wasn't raised in a beware of killer cop culture. My respect for authority is the right thing to do. It wasn't given to me by the matriarchs of survival skill. We weren't worried about getting killed. Fear 5-0 was actually fear of mama. Come home in a squad car if you want to. We, the rambunctious rascals, neighborhood knuckleheads, thugs before thugs meant nigga, would purposely trip alarms and 911 ourselves to play hot and go seek with the police because we were stupid, stun guns were science fiction, and Tamir Rice hadn't been born yet. I've been a human for over 40 years and a nurse for 20. A man in scrubs is as frail and fallible as a man in blue, but we have the power of life and death. We are here to serve you. We are not authorized. Bad days and mistakes, survival should not be predicated on politeness, suspicious behavior. I suspect I'm pissed because you pulled me over into that little old lady that's fed by me at 90. I suspect I'm terrified because you rolled my butt till I made a ticket of a mistake. I suspect you might be friends with the man that didn't like the bland taste of Sandra's attitude. And once again, I find myself the victim of another police execution of his lawful duties. He got it right. I was in the wrong. So I was blessed enough to add him to a, a pathetically long list of police officers who allowed me to walk away. I mean, drive away. I mean, live that day. I am from Texas, where we have a right to open carry. The problem with open carry is it makes you a target. And by open carry, I mean the melanin loaded in the chambers of my skin. Hootie who? This poem is hashtags and halos. It was specifically written at the, at the request of Chris Haywood, the, uh, the young man who made the documentary for Chris Rogers' mural. Uh, interesting note, I had not seen the mural before I finished writing this poem. George Floyd, the usual suspect, Kill for maybe a fake dollar or check. Proof, life is not what they respect. Who's next to get a knee in the neck? Black ball player, black ball for taking a knee. Black man dies when cop takes a knee. I can't breathe, mama. I don't want to be another hashtag or halo. I mean, how can one sort of success when they clip the wings of James Burrs with Jasper City Dragons? We, we can't even go jogging without buckshots in our belly. They made a meal of Tamir Rice seasoned with hashtags and halos sprinkled with bullets smothered in sauteed bloody bodies over BB guns in the park, like the ones Rakia Boyd caught, and the only probable cause is systemic racism. A new video every week. When they can't pull us out the car in the streets, they deliver hashtags and halos to our couch. No knock means no right to fight back even when they got the wrong house. Black women aren't safe behind closed doors. Not when the name of the bullet looks like yours, Brianna. Taylor made excuses for every murder. She looked suspicious. She fit the description. She was resistant. We, we sweetened salty tears with, with Sandra Bland hashtag, another tragedy to follow, another suspicious step to swallow. It's like they're hungry for more hashtags and halos. King brought us peace and they killed him. Our people pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and they bombed them, built our own churches and they burned them. They don't see color. And we don't see justice. They riot when the team wins. We riot when they slaughter kin. How can you compare that? I don't want to see the flame catch 
but we be barrel of black powder, they be lit match. I believe in peace. I don't want to see my city burn, but we have a right to defend ourselves, and we run out of cheeks to turn. No more hashtags. No more halo. No more hashtags. No more halo. No more hashtags. No more halo. Thank you, thank you for your words, Christopher Michael. And so, as if you have not already heard heard those words, then that means I'm gonna drop a link for you in for y'all in the um, chat box to go watch um, the mini documentary produced by um, um, Chris Hayward, hashtags and halos. Um, that features Chris Rogers creating the mural we'll, that we're here to, to talk about and other murals today, um, and um, Christopher Michael's poetry. Um, so I highly encourage, if you haven't already watched that, it's like 14, 15 minutes. It's a really incredible look in t and documentation of the making of this mural. And so um, to introduce Chris Rogers today, um, so since his love, his young love for Marvel and DC Comics, Chris Rogers has been creating art ever since he could hold a crayon or scented marker. Graduated from Hobart and William Smith Colleges in New York with a BA in studio art, Rogers moved to Austin in 2012 and quickly became a staple in the local scene with his live paintings, commercial and residential mural work, and acrylic and oil paintings. All right. Let's see. All right. Hey, Chris, do you, I just introduced you, but would you like to introduce yourself a little? Yeah, sure. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Chris Rogers, and I'm a artist muralist here in um, Austin, Texas, and um, I guess now somewhat of an activist um, with these these murals that I've been doing as of late in the past few years. And one of them in particular, the um, my latest one over on the uh, side of Native Hostel um, on East Fourth and. Um, 35 um, entitled if he can't breathe we can't breathe and I did that in response to uh, George Floyd's murder this, uh, three months ago and now I'm here to talk about it so. yeah and thanks thanks for joining us I guess um, to just jump right into it um, after a few days after um, the murder of George Floyd um, you posted on Instagram um, just very simply, like, I need a wall to paint on. Um, can you tell me what what was going through your mind at that point? Um, well, at, at the time, I was um, working on a series of murals over at uh, Victory Grill on East 11th, and I was working on the first mural, and, it, and it's, it's a, a scene, like one of those smoky jazz scenes, um, of a concert with B.B. Uh, King, James Brown, Billie Holiday, Chuck Berry, Marvin Gaye, Ike and Tina Turner. And I was probably about 75, 80% done with that when George Floyd was, was murdered and uh, that Monday. And I spent the next two days really trying not to think about it because it hurt so much that seeing that video and um, I'm sitting here painting this mural and I'm thinking about the lyrics of, of Marvin Gaye and Billie Holiday, Strange Fruit and what's going on and James Brown and Black and I'm Proud. And it, it just, it really was a very sobering moment for me uh, because it, it, it reminded me like they're singing about the same thing that's going on right now in 2020 and nothing has changed. And, you know, I, I'll be perfectly honest. I even kind of subscribe to this, this notion like, Oh, we've come so far and look, we're making all this progress and this, that, and the other. And 
after after witnessing that video in particular not that i haven't seen that or didn't know that that was going on but it was just this grand presentation that nothing has changed especially when it comes to the black plight in america um and it, it was i couldn't really think about anything else i had another two three murals to work on at uh victory grill and i took it upon myself on wednesday to talk to the owner who um hired me to do these murals and asked him if there was something if he was okay with me putting uh pressing pause on this project to do something because that on wednesday i was driving across 35 and that was the day um where the protesters shut down 35 so there's all these people all over 35 and i'm sitting here uh about to go paint a mural that has nothing to do with what's going on and so i just felt like i I needed to do something and that's when I was prompted to uh, put a, um, a message out on my, my Instagram stories asking for a wall and um, Native Hostel hit me up literally 15 minutes later and the rest is <laughs> history really. Okay and so um, as once Native host Hostel like messaged you and um once you had your canvas um can you take me a little through your thought process about um what yeah what, what, what were your first thoughts take me through your decisions for the mural um and how how you sort of brought us the mural we know now well it was a, it was a process like i i, I I had no idea what I was going to paint exactly. Um, I just, I just knew in my heart that I wanted to say something more than uh, RIP with a halo and some wings, which is what was going on all over the world and beautifully um, done. And I respect that, but I thought it was a beautiful opportunity, especially, and, and this is how I feel to this day um, with everything going on. But the only silver lining that I could take away from George Floyd's murder was that it happened in HD for multiple angles with 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 people witnessing and they disclosed the entire story for the entire world to see. So the only way that you could rationalize what had happened that, that day is if you're foaming at the mouth racist or just in complete denial. So there are a lot of people that um, maybe weren't as privy to what, what has been going on with black people in, in America um, who were now aware that black people aren't walking around with chips on their shoulder and that they're not telling ghost stories. Like people are getting murdered in broad daylight with, with cameras rolling and nothing is happening. So I thought it was a great opportunity to say something why there are more people um, attuned to, um, what is going on with, with black people. And I, I feel like that, that video not only allowed people to see, but to feel. Like there's no way you could watch that video and not your heart not break in some way or fashion. Mine shattered. And I had no idea what to say or do. I just knew I needed to do something. And I wanted to scream at somebody, but I didn't know who to scream at. I wanted to punch something, but I didn't know what to punch. So um, I took a day to kind of formulate what I wanted to say. And the first thing that came to my mind was that this image of Colin Kaepernick looking straight, taking a knee, looking straight down at the murder scene. Um, and at first I, I was just gonna use George Floyd, but then I thought it'd probably be a good idea to use some more prominent examples of what, what had been going on with police brutality um, towards black people and use these faces, Tamir Rice, Breonna Taylor, um, Eric Garner, Ahmaud Arbery, um, and even in Austin, uh, Mike Ramos, and use these, these um, cases um, to amplify this message. And more, more than just talking about police brutality, I wanted to um, shed a light on more of a the root of these things and i i know that it, police brutality like me focusing just on cops as the problem with the racism in this country is 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 
it's it's not getting to the root of the problem and and so i wanted to talk about the fundamental and that's that's why i chose to go from at first i was just going to have everybody's face up there in blue different shades of blue to say that they can't breathe but um as i was thinking about it in the first few days where i started uh, you know erecting this composition it kind of dawned on me to utilize my own uh experience in in recovery and that's where i started to think about the correlation between um addiction and um racism and i knew for me uh i've been sober for about six and a half years um i got sober in january of um, 2014 and I knew well before 2014 that I needed help I knew it um, and everybody everybody not everybody but a lot of people made it abundantly clear that I needed to get help and uh, you know until I was ready to deal with my reality you could not tell me anything you couldn't tell me anything and as a matter of fact if you came at me I would just dig my heels in and I, I see no difference between um, people sobering up to the racism in this country and then what was happening to me when I was getting sober from alcohol and drugs and what allowed me to get sober and take those those very uncomfortable first steps into recovery and to deal with my own reality was that there was a space filled with people that normally don't mix the motley crew if you will and nobody was waving, waving their finger at me or telling me to check my privilege or what took you so long. They welcomed me. They, they, there was no hierarchy. There was nothing I had to subscribe to. There was, there was no fee I had to pay. I, just by virtue of me showing up, I was a card-carrying member, and I needed that. Because outside of, outside of the physical uh, addiction to alcohol, the second most powerful thing that kept me in that groundhog day of my addiction was the guilt and the shame and this this group allowed me to for for allowed me um a mirror to see myself in other people allowed me to see myself in them because prior to that i just felt like i was the biggest piece of crap nobody understands nobody's got as bad as me i just felt completely alone and i, I know for a fact there's a lot of people that are sobering up to the racism in this country with that same level of shame and guilt. And I wanted to welcome them just the way I was welcomed. Because that was, that was my main objective for this whole, this whole mural is to get people, as many different people on the same page that we have a problem. Not just black people, we have a problem. And so that's where I utilized Colin Kaepernick looking down at the murder. The first thing that you see is Colin Kaepernick and he's looking straight down to the murder. So we can get on the same page that this dude didn't OD from, from whatever drug. He wasn't out of shape and just ran out of air. He was murdered in broad daylight. And this is going on and it's a problem. Have you found that, I know you've talked about, yeah, wanting to this mural to start the hard conversations. Mm -hmm. Have you found uh, that people have been starting these hard conversations? Have you found that this has produced some of the reactions that you've been wanting it to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, look, it took me almost, almost a month to complete the mural. And it, number one, the, the biggest thing was that I had so many people coming up while I was working on it. Like eventually I had to go full nocturnal just so I could be uninterrupted and, and finish the mural. And I'm not, I wanted that. I wanted that to happen. I wanted these, this mural to spark conversations. I had so many conversations with so many different people about this topic. And I mean, there, the one that stands out to me was there was, there was one woman who, white, uh, in her 50s and conservative. And she came up to me when I was painting one night and you know i was sitting down on the curb in front of the mural just looking at it and she sat down next to me and just started talking you know and the, she opened up the conversation by telling me about how she felt a little guilty or felt a little dumb i don't know her exact words but she felt bad because up until a few weeks ago she thought that Colin kaepernick was 
legitimately protesting the troops and the flags. And, and I didn't look at her wrong. I didn't make her feel uncomfortable. I just listened. I let her go. And then when she was done speaking, I, I, I spoke and I told her how I felt. And it was like a 20 minute conversation. It was phenomenal. And like towards the end of the conversation, I could tell like her, her energy had changed. Like she had a little smile on her face. And I asked her, I was like, how are you feeling right now? And she said, I feel pretty good. And I was like, can you imagine if, you know, just a fraction of the people around the world were having conversations just like this to connect the dots? To understand that we're all on the same page, the whole same page. We really all want the same thing. Yes, there are some outliers and some extremists, but that's not the majority. And so that that was just one example of many conversations that I had during the creation of this this mural. And afterwards, I know in my own life, I've had so many conversations, and I think that's 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 the real medicine for this whole deal. Like I, I I've said this before, like. We need all the legislation. We need, you know, new laws to be enforced and written, and old laws to be, you know, thrown out or amended. One of the two or both. Um, but I, I'm, I really truly believe, just like in my own uh, recovery from alcohol, that the real medicine that we need is one another, and to see one another in one another. And um, I just know for a fact that if that officer that murdered um, George Floyd was able to get a glimpse of himself in George Floyd, if he didn't see George Floyd as this thing, or it, or they, that I have to take care of, um, he would, there's no way he would have been able to do that. It's impossible for me to want to inflict harm on you if I see my, if I recognize myself in you. You know, conversely, if I don't, then it's like, you know, I'm stepping on a cockroach. And that's unfortunately how, um, a lot of uh, authorities in, in this country paint black people to be cockroaches. These things we have to deal with. Can I jump in on that for a second? Yep. Go for it. So by nature, human beings cannot hurt other human beings. Now I'm speaking, I'm speaking as a medical professional and a trained soldier. We cannot kill other human beings. It is, it's against our nature to do so. In order for us to kill another human being, we have to dehumanize it, deconstruct it, and make it something other than a human being. So when I was in the military, I wasn't training to kill other human beings. I trained to kill communists. I trained to kill reds. Um, then it was uh, training to kill sand niggas, goose. Uh, it was uh, training to, you train to kill the en enemy that is not like you. Now, the Democrats against the Republicans, it's not human beings against human beings. It's you, that creature that is not like me is trying to take something away from me. So it's so much easier when you can pull the trigger on somebody because you have developed the ability not to see your own, not to see yourself in them or see their humanity. So Chris is absolutely spot on on that. And once that woman, was able to see uh, your hum humanity, Chris, was, was able to see the rest of our humanity. That put a smile on her face and she was like, oh, he's got some legitimate issues going on. It's got nothing to do with what they're saying it is. This is another human being that is hurting. So now, now that I recognize that, I can go listen and hear what they have to say. Brilliant, spot on. May I, Christopher, Michael, may I, um, since you jumped in here, can I ask you both a question? Go ahead. Well, um, to sort of put a spin, um, a bit of a different spin on the question that you typed in the chat, I, prom I promise you I was going to get to it. Um, but do you two um, feel like there was a cost to y'all spiritually or emotionally when you have to prove or argue for your humanity in these types of conversations yes yes i haven't been able to write the last thing i wrote was hashtags and halos was that was that three or four months ago and it's been very difficult to write before the, since then because all of my poems all of my art although necessary was all black anguish black consciousness uh black pain 
and I can only I can only get on stage and do that so many times before before it takes a toll on me because I'm given a piece of myself and eventually I'm going to run out of pieces. Um, I, I'm sick and tired and of 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 hearing and 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 living through this thing. Um, but I have the privilege of not being as sick and tired as the family members who have dead loved ones in the streets because they were slaughtered for for no damn reason. Um, but it but it is taking it is taking a lot from me, and I don't know I don't know how much I have left. Floor is mine. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, I feel the same way. I feel the exact same way. I was exhausted. Um, well before I even finished that mural. Um, and it took me literally a week to, a week of sleeping and doing nothing and barely getting out of bed and, you know, just resting to bring it back to neutral. Um, that was exhausting. And it is exhausting um, to be open and attuned. Cause that, that's, as an artist, that's one thing that I, I, I've come to really understand about where, where my creative creativity comes from and it's not something that it comes from within it comes from without and in order for me to be really honest and and create um my best work i have to be open i have to be vulnerable i have to feel um which is the polar opposite of how i used to conduct myself when i was drinking but nowadays like i need to be open and yeah there are times where i get depleted and a lot of my work has been centered around the the issues as of late um but i i'm i just feel thankful and uh just like with that the the mural that i did um if he can't breathe we can't breathe uh it's 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 helping it's helping people there are a lot of people that came up to me well before i was even done with it that were uh in tears or they were smiling um because it gave them something, it gave them a boost, it gave them hope. I mean, I'm telling you, like, I was, as I was saying before I started the mural, like, I wanted to scream, I wanted to punch something, but I didn't know. I felt like I was in a straitjacket spiritually. Um, but as soon as I started painting, man, there was this release, and it didn't, it didn't free me from any of the pain or anything that I was feeling, but at least it was going somewhere positive, and it was being useful to something more than me. And so anytime that I start to get overwhelmed or I want to tune out because it's too heavy, um, I, I definitely retreat and I definitely, you know, replenish and take care of myself. But I remind myself that um, one of the most important things that I got going on with my art is, is that it's, it's useful to people. Um, and especially in a time like this, people need it, man. I need it. Um, because it's it's super heavy out there, man. You know, and people are really hopeless and really frustrated I mean, during a pandemic and, you know, losing homes and losing family members. I mean, I've lost family members. I've lost friends during this thing. And it's tough. It's really, really tough. But um, just like I said, with that mural, like we need each other. We got to have each other. And it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not like taking one pill. It's, it's, it's a daily practice. You know, I need to be reminded that I'm not alone every single day. Like it is a chorus of people that I have around me that help me maintain and, and, and stay, stay the course. Um, I don't do it alone anymore. And so um, I, don't, I don't see this any different from what's going on with me personally and what's going on with the city and what's going on with the country at large. So. So you mentioned something I want to ask again, if Christopher, Michael, if you want to jump in on this, you're totally welcome um, about um, taking care of yourself and making space for yourself and for joy in an, a time that is incredibly heavy. So I want to ask how you foster practices of taking care of yourself and joy for yourself as Um, uh, the first thing I do is rest, um, and I try to get outside, try to get into nature. Um, I grew up on, you know, the coast of South Carolina, Hilton Head, South Carolina. So I'm, I grew up on an island. I'm used to the beach. I knew that was going to be 
a big hit I was going to take moving to Austin, Texas. But um, I, I've known my whole life that I, I, I get I receive a lot of positive energy from from nature. So I try to get outside. I try to get around other people that are that are positive and um, rest, you know, and just get back at it. Real simple. I am not a good caretaker of myself. I burn the candle at both ends. Uh, when I'm do when I am taking care of myself, I'm practicing escapism through TV and movies. But coincidentally enough, I finally put my foot down and said I was taking a break. I told my board, "Hey, you won't see me again until such a such a date. I'm done." Unfortunately, I put my foot down so hard. Corona hit and the whole country shut down. My bad, everybody. We will forgive you this time. <laughs> Don't put the other foot down. <laughs> um, so I guess um, moving, moving on, I wanted to also discuss um, the, uh, your mural, Chris, your mural at, um, of Mike Ramos at La Mexicana Bakery. Okay. Yeah. Good old Mike Ramos. What, what would you like to know about it? So um, I guess tell me a little about how you got started on this mural, like um, how you connected with, I think it was um, one of Mike Ramos' parents that um, you're working with? His mother. His mother. I, I again, well, I didn't say this, but one of one of the things that helped me kind of um, create this the thesis of my last mural, "If He Can't Breathe, We Can't Breathe," were the many conversations that I had with pe pe passerbys um, and just conversations I had with other people. And so I, I wasn't even I wasn't even planning on putting Mike Ramos in that mural, um, but there were a lot of people that reached out and made me aware of uh, Mike Ram Ramos's case. And so it was a no brainer for me to put him up there. And once I did, word got out to his mother and it wasn't long after that, that she you know, reached out and said, thank you. And when I was finished with the mural, she came down to the mural and, and um, you know, we spoke and took some pictures in front of the mural. Um, and I think it was probably three, four weeks after I finished, the uh, if he can't breathe, we can't breathe. That she reached out to me personally and asked me if I was able and willing to do um, another mural specifically for Mike. Um, and she um, mentioned that La Mecana um, Bakery on South First um, was a a spot that um, they used to frequent. Mike and his mother used to frequent as a kid uh, growing up in that area. Um, so they they had this big wall that. Um, they were willing to donate. And just like with uh, the previous mural, if he can't breathe, we can't breathe. I wanted to say something more than just, you know, RIP, angel wings, halo. Um, I wanted to uh, make a statement. I wanted to have something loud that would get attention because just like every other major case in this, in this country, they're sweeping it on the rug. They're passing the buck. And there's zero justice, zero, you know, arrests. I mean, with body cams on, with the full thing disclosed, like no arrests. And there is something eerily uh, reminiscent uh, in Brenda Ramos to my mother. She, my mother passed away in 2009. And the only thing that I'm thankful for about my mother passing away is that she didn't have to bury me. Because I know for a fact that would have broken my mother in half. And... I think about Brenda Ramos and not only did she lose her son, but her son was murdered and no justice is happening. I can only imagine, I mean, there's no way she could be healing right now. And so, you know, I, I've, I've other projects going on, but I, I've been making time throughout the last three and a half weeks to work on this mural. And my concept for that mural was, uh, if you've ever seen the movie um, Inception, um, and also a hurricane. I was thinking about a hurricane, how the eye of the hurricane would be Mike Ramos. And he was a big uh, UT fan. And so I wanted to put in, you know, some, the tower and the Capitol building with 
uh, the frost building and have everything kind of like breaking apart, busting apart around him and just his, his gaze is faced straight ahead um, to connect. Um, Cause that's what I want people to get from this mural. I want people to feel Mike, feel his plight and not just Mike's plight, but everybody, everybody who's, who's lost their life to police brutality and is, is, has not received justice. Um, I want people to feel that. I want people to understand that again, that this is not happening to a black person. This is somebody's child. This is somebody's friend. This is somebody's son um, that was murdered. And I want people to see themselves in this person. So there you go. What has been um, the, some of the rea reaction, um, reactions you've seen from people around the mural? happy people are happy uh you know there wasn't even a budget for this mural uh and before i got started i i, I put out a, a little venmo a little blurb with my venmo and you know people supported immediately and then most of the people were friends and family of mike ramos you know that's 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 what this is all about it's 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 helping helping people to heal um, just like with the George Floyd mural, if he can't breathe, we can't breathe. Like it's giving, it's giving people, it's using, using my voice um, and, 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 and keeping the spirit alive and not allowing um, this to be just a, a, a new cycle. And so I want to talk a little about um, the two, um, I don't know if you call them murals, but um, the two um, Black Austin Matters and Black Artists Matter um, that have been painted on the ground on Congress and East 12th. Um, and I wanna ask what, what your perspective on those are, because I know some people have, that I know there's been some, not pushback against them, but is this all, we, is this all that Austin is going to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, I appreciate it. It's a very nice gesture. Um, I was watching a show uh, with Shannon Sharp and he said this, he was like, uh, we, we, enough, enough, we need substance. Like enough of the rhetoric, enough with the, the, the symbols, we need sustenance. And for, for black people in America, like we need real change real things to happen. Brighton, you know, Black Lives Matter in the middle of the street, it's a beautiful gesture. It, it looks nice on social media, this, that, and the other, but just as we've, we've noticed, people are still being murdered. There's still no justice. It's the same old stuff. What steps do you feel um, people in Austin could actually take to make those statements Black Lives Matter and Black Artists Matter true? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I'm, I am not a politician. <laughs> like I have, you know, I'm not a mathematician. Like I can barely do my taxes, you know what I'm saying? But uh, I, I, I really, again, that just goes back to the only thing that I know. And, and, and that's, that's the people, that's us. I mean, we make up the government we make up the police task force. We make up all these officials. Like, yes, it's the system that needs to be corrected, but I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, the only thing I, I can think about is, is how to heal, you know, and that's not going to come from, I, I, this is just how I feel. It's like, I, I, we could get the new legislation. You could, you could give every black person in America, you can give us all reparations, but it's not going to heal our hearts. Like we need, we need to heal. And the only way that I know how to heal is through other people, man. And people coming together and really, really, as I said before, seeing one another in one another, you know, and, and maybe it might be a tough call for a lot of people like adults now, but I'm, I'm really focused on, on those kids, man. Cause that this is the, racism is learned. It is absorbed. Babies do not come into this world with that hate in their heart. They, they're taught it, they absorb it. And so that's really where my, my, my heart and mind is, is with the next generation. Um, 
I have, I have the highest hopes for myself and everybody else that are that are grown up and, and adult now. But you know, it's a marathon, not a not a sprint. And Christopher Michael, I see your comment. Accountability. Do you want to jump in on this? No sooner did I type the word accountability in all caps, mind you, the thought occurred to me, but by whose standard? Because the police officers who are doing whatever it is they're doing and taking action, they are being held accountable. They're just not being held accountable to the standard that we think is right. I mean, a couple of days paid suspension while they investigate. The people investigating by like, mm, nothing to see here. I see no wrong. So they were held accountable. It just wasn't the human accountability that we think should exist. Mm. And I'm not entirely sure what to do about that one. Actually, I am partially sure, um, but I don't want to be held accountable for what I really want to say. Ah. All right, and then, and then I guess um, going into ac accountability um, and Austin specifically, because I know um, sometimes I've lived in Austin my whole life. So sometimes I think Austin can see, it, see itself as above the rest of Texas, just because we are a very diff, Austin is very different. Um, it's the blueberry in the tomato soup as it takes part. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's also not immune to racism and it's not immune to the conversations we're having and to the things that need to improve. So if either one of y'all want to talk a little about, um, I guess, some of how you personally, if you feel comfortable, how y'all personally have um, seen racism in Austin? I don't know. I don't, really have, I don't have that many examples of personal accounts that I've experienced uh, racism, but I mean, I grew up in South Carolina and, you know, there, there's definitely a, a, a different flavor to the racism in Texas. I'll give you, I'll give Texas that for sure. Um, but it's everywhere. And I mean, I, I went to school up in New England and Connecticut and Maine and upstate New York, and I experienced just as much racism. It just wasn't so overt. Uh, and it's, it's just been a part of the fabric of my, my upbringing. I mean, you go to, you go to Hilton Head, South Carolina today, right now, take a trip right there and you will find multiple gated communities that are all called plantations. That's, that's, that's the reality. And so it's not all, you're right. It is the blue, Austin is the blueberry and the tomato soup, but it's around, it's here. I can, I can smell it. I can taste it. Um, I can't always call it, but it's, it's there. Um, but I try, I try my best not to focus on it too much because I, and this is, again, this is just my heart of hearts, man. I, I feel like I've been very fortunate. Um, you know, I'm biracial. I was raised by, you know, a single white mother. Um, I, I've had a, a lot of different friends and even, you know, going to school in different parts of the country. I've come, in, I've come into contact with a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds. And I myself have been able to come to the conclusion that people are people. Like there, there are... There are assholes in every genre, you name it, and there are amazing people in every genre. Um, but that is not the reality for a lot of people. And so um, I try to focus on um, who is j just like with re just like with my recovery. Like it is, it's 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 futile for me to want to try to talk someone someone into getting sober. It's a waste of my time. Just like when I was out there drinking, like you were wasting your time with me until I was ready. Uh, and so those are the people that I, I try to turn my attention to and stay open to. Um, uh, those that are willing to learn, willing to listen as much as I am. 
I think uh, so. I spend most. I, I live and work in uh, in Colleen, Texas, but I spend most of my time, especially with performances in in Austin. Um, so I think the racism, from my point of view, the racism that manifests in Austin is economic based, and it may not necessarily be racism, more socialism and powerism. It's the uh, the gentrification, and it's the it's the haves versus the have nots. Um, the other issue that I see Austin having, because Austin is 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 uber liberal. It's it's the it's the kind of liberal that makes. I thought I was liberal, so I started hanging out with Austin. And Austin, I'm like, oh well, maybe I'm conservative after all. But the people you do encounter who are liberal, um, not not to put it on liberals, but the individuals who who have achieved or who, who are even fighting are really self-righteous. And because they feel like they're on a path to righteousness or making the world better, anybody who isn't on that path at the same pace, then they kind of they kind of turn on them. Um, it's like you're it, it's it's when you um the, the example can be seen when you see a video of a peaceful uh, Black Lives Matter rally, but the people who are the most on video, I'm not there at all the rallies, on video, the people you see who are most aggressive are the white folks. Like, I mean, we angry, they killing us, but man, y'all over the top with it. Like, just come on we got this come on with us don't you can't have all the spotlight this is about us we need your support we need you holding us at this is the moment where we need you holding us up not jumping on our shoulders so everybody can 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 see you doing it but the self-righteousness gets becomes a freight train and it and it 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 plows through everyone not only the people who are truly hurt not only people who are trying to help, but it plows through the people that need to be reached, uh, who haven't seen the light, who haven't sat down and talked with Christopher Rogers in front of an amazing mural to find out that that Kaepernick was actually on to the right thing. So that's my assessment and my experience in Austin, Texas. The self-righteousness is a freight train. Ooh, let me write that down. That, that might be a poem next. <laughs> that copyright that somebody still at. So we have a few minutes left here before Christopher and Michael will grace us with a closing poem. Um, to ask you both, um, to ask you both um, a last question, We've got 16 participants, um, 16 people who are capable of having conversations, um, uh, who are capable of introspection and who are capable of making change in their own corners of the world. What do you hope people here today walk away with? Go ahead, Chris. There are uh, just notice only my battery is going dead. So there, are, let me put this on the grid. I want to see some of these faces. There seems to be um, a, a, a good number, if not majority, um, white women in the group. And this is fantastic. Um, we, we need for you to hear us. But take this to heart. We don't need for you to take up our space when it's time to speak, especially if we're there, we can speak on our own. What we really, really need for you to do is go into the places that we are not allowed to go into or, or go into the places that won't listen to us. We need you into those boardrooms or golf courses that are still closed to us. We need you at the dinner table of the families that we won't be sitting at. That is where we need for you to advocate and fight for us, the places we can't get into, because we got our own voices. We know how to speak. We know how powerful we are. But you're the secret weapon to get in where we can't get in. Please 
take that to heart and remember that. Beautifully said. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll I, I'd echo those sentiments, um, especially when it comes to speaking to those that, that I wouldn't be speaking to. Um, but for me, the, the, the biggest thing that I'd like anybody to take away from uh, this talk or, or, or my, any of my artwork um, surrounding these topics is that we have a problem, not black people have a problem, but this is a problem that we all have. Racism touches every single one of us. I'd be lying to you and everybody on this chat right now if I told you that there's not some, some, some notes of racism within me. Um, it's just there. It's just there. But um, moving forward, uh, we need everybody. I, I think about it like this. I think about Black Lives Matter like a, a, a super highway with a thousand lanes. And every single one of those lanes needs to be filled up. Whatever it is, whatever, whatever do you teach, do you, do you sing, do you, um, do you work in office, whatever it is. And for me, uh, my lane is bridging the gap. My, my lane is to paint. My lane is to have conversations and discussions and to help people see the, the similarities and also celebrate the differences um, so that we can all connect and so that we can all heal and all move forward. All right. Thank you all. And Christopher Michael, would you like to do the closing honors? Absolutely. If we can hear the sound of the ocean in a seashell, then can we hear the sound of the ghetto in a Coke can? From the ocean, do we hear the cries of a people ghosted into nothing, choosing the waters of triangular trade over being traded on the auction block from the, from the ghetto? Do we then hear the moans of the people left behind with empty hands, annihilated identity, castrated culture, severed tongues, fighting for a wrong or a bootstrap just to pull themselves up by. No, there is no ocean in seashell, but it does resonate an ensemble of ambient air, a discarded thing, pulling in the vibrations of a world around it, giving the ear something to dance to, the mind something to think about, thought becomes desire, turn action, creation, brushstroke, becomes painted picture, then pen on page, then poem. We are people powerful enough to turn nothing into something. We make a way out of no way. We nurture nations with empty pantries. We fix mama magic to scraps into fine cuisine, then food for the soul. They, they love how we translate our frequency. It's so jazzy how we rock. We made our blues a sellable sound. We wrapped the king's tongue around our drum now. Everyone wants to be hip. We can orchestra, orient to ambient noises and, and, and to symphonies and to sounds. Oh. And when it's all said and done, we turn nothing into something. We create something out of nothing. And when you are a people like that, the only thing that can stand in your way is nothing. Who do you? Hey, Lily, could I say one last thing? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to thank everybody. I want to thank you, Lily, and I want to thank Chris for those powerful words. Man, I was getting chilled the entire time, man. Um, but I want to thank everybody for showing up and doing everything um, to help. And, and nobody's doing this thing perfect. I don't have the ideas, but what gives me hope going forward is that when I look at these demonstrations and when I hear about these demonstrations, the, 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 the sea of, of different shades of color all attuned towards the same movement. That gives me a lot of hope and that really gives me a lot of peace and solace going forward. So thank you guys for showing up and being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. Thank you, everyone. That um, thank you, Chris, both Chris's, um, for coming out today. Thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your day. Um, and you, we all have our homework. Thank you. Have a good night, y'all. I can't. Hey, Carrie, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Carrie? Um, what, what, what? I, how, how now I, I can hear you. <laughs> I had my mute on. <laughs> is this whole thing recorded? It. I hope so. Um, Lily, yes. did you let me pause that right now? Yeah. Okay, okay, great.